There is no such thing as AGI because uh, we can talk about human level AI, but human, le human intelligence is very specialized. So we shouldn't be talking about AGI at all. So Meta's chief scientist has said something that has ruffled some feathers in the AI community. Jan Lekin is a member of Meta's AI team and he leads a division that is working on something different. But his recent comment has, like I said before, made some people wonder what's really going on with this AGI thing. Just take a listen. Uh, we should be talking about what kind of intelligence can we observe in humans and animals that current AI systems don't have. And, you know, there's a lot of things that current AI systems don't have that your cat has or your dog. And, and they don't have anything close to general intelligence. So the problem we have to solve is how to get machines to learn as efficiently as humans and animals. That is useful for a lot of applications. Uh, this is the future because we're going to have AI assistants that, you know, we talk to help us in our daily lives. We need those systems to have human level intelligence. So, uh, you know, that's, that's why we need it. Uh, we need to do it right. So his statement there was actually rather fascinating. He said that we shouldn't even be talking about AGI at all, and we should be talking about what kind of intelligence we observe in humans and animals that currently AI systems don't have. It's a very, very interesting perspective, and it makes the AI industry one of the most interesting ones because, you know, people just don't agree on certain things. Now, this AGI debate on what AGI is and what AGI isn't, there's a lot more that is explained in a recent article by the Financial Times. You can see here, he says Meta's AI chief says that large language models will not reach human intelligence. Yanlikin argues that current AI methods are flawed as he pushes for world modeling vision with super intelligence. And take a read at this because I think it's important to have different and other AI perspectives that show you that the path that everyone is currently on might not be the path that we use to get to super intelligence. And remember, this is one of the most respected AI researchers that have been in the field for a very, very long time and has made numerous contributions to the field. So take a look at this. Meta's AI chief said that the large language models that power generative AI products such as ChatGPT would never achieve the ability to reason and plan like humans as he focused instead on a radical alternative to create super intelligence in machines okay and i think it's pretty crazy that he's focusing on something that will create super intelligence and is basically stating that llms have i wouldn't say plateaued but they're not the kind of intelligence that you can effectively scale take a look at this okay he said that llms have very limited understanding of logic do not understand the physical world do not have persistent memory cannot reason in any reasonable definition of the term and cannot plan hierarchically. And I honestly say you do have to agree with some of the things that he says. I mean, a very limited understanding of logic. This is something that if you've actually tested GPT-4's version, not the version of logic, but if you've tested like how the logic actually, I guess you could say is understood sometimes, it doesn't truly understand certain things. Like for example, if you ask it to count the number of R's in strawberry, it gets it wrong. But if you ask it to count it out letter by letter, it then gets it right. If you pre present, you know, certain logic problems that are very simple to a human, sometimes GPT-4 will get it wrong and then sometimes it will get it right, okay? Um, and that is apparently a limitation of these large language models. Now, in addition, of course, they do not understand the physical world. And I think understanding the physical world, how things interact and how they are, is of course an important component of how we learn and how we digest information. I mean, it's a lot more than these LLM systems have because we have the senses of touch, we have smell, we have sight, I mean, all of these, you know, senses and LLMs, what do they really have? They just have text, which is, I guess you could say, very limited in terms of, you know, how much intelligence you're allowed to grab. And of course, we have, you know, persistent memory. This is something that is really, really important if we want a system to be able to effectively become smarter and effectively learn. So persistent memory is something that, you know, I guess you could say 
they're making some strides in it but i guess the only way we're going to know is if there are any research papers that are published surrounding this area and of course if any of the big labs do state something like that now so i mean there are a lot of limitations on llms that most people don't think about if you're actually trying to get to agi like all of these things understanding of logic understanding of the physical world a persistent memory you know being able to reason in a, in a decent definition and being able to plan hierarchically those are things that you know when you think about it really like you really break it down the average human can do these things you know with i guess you could say not ease but it's not impossible for the average human to do this. I mean, humans just have this innate understanding of, you know, basic logic of the physical world and, of course, a persistent memory. Now, there are also some other things that were said. You know, we do have the fact that he is developing an entirely new generation of AI systems that he will hope will power machines with human level intelligence. Although he said that this vision could take 10 years to achieve. So he's basically... I wouldn't say given up on generative AI, but he's working on something completely different. And one of the you know key indicators of this is that every time a Llama 3 paper is released, sometimes people say congratulations, Jan Lacuna, but he always states that, hey, uh, it wasn't actually me that worked on this. We're working on something completely different. And he describes it here. And I'm going to show you guys a video where basically he talks about this, but he describes it here. He says, this is the article in the Financial Times where I explain that autoregressive LLMs are insufficient to reach human level intelligence or even cat level intelligence. But alternative architectures, and this is where the meat of the video comes into play, objective driven may reach human level intelligence one day they use world models based on jepa joint embedding predictive architectures which are not generative with this we may have systems that understand the physical world have persistent memory can reason can plan and perhaps hierarchically so this is where we take a look at uh you know his new architecture that they're working on which is i guess you could say the path to super intelligence slash agi Today, machines require thousands of examples and hours of training to learn a single concept. The goal with JEPAs, which means Joint Embedding Predictive Architectures, is to create highly intelligent machines that can learn as efficiently as humans. VJEP is pre-trained on video data, allowing it to efficiently learn concepts about the physical world, similar to how a baby learns by observing its parents. It's able to learn new concepts and solve new tasks using only a few examples without full fine-tuning. VJEPA is a non-generative model that learns by predicting missing or masked parts of a video in an abstract representation space. Unlike generative approaches that try and fill in every missing pixel, VJEPA has the flexibility to discard irrelevant information, which leads to more efficient training. To allow our fellow researchers to build upon this work, we're publicly releasing VJEPA. We believe this work is another important step in the journey towards AI that's able to understand the world, plan, reason, predict, an accomplished complex task. Very, very fascinating, okay? Something, something very, very interesting that you need to uh, know. So, of course, we know that VJEPA right here is, you know, self-supervised learning. You know, it's trained using unlabeled data, meaning that it doesn't need predefined labels to learn. This is basically the, the process of self-supervised learning, which essentially is just more efficient and it kind of mirrors how humans naturally learn from their environment. And with VJEPA, you have this abstract representation. So, this is higher level understanding. So instead of focusing on every tiny detail, VJEPA learns to understand videos in an abstract way. For example, it can recognize actions like picking up or putting down a pen without needing to analyze every single pixel in the video. And the model essentially learns by masking parts of videos. So the model learns by, you know, um, predicting the missing parts and it helps and this helps basically develop a deeper understanding of sequences and interactions with the video so basically he, you know he kind of describes this right here with as to why this is a lot more effective than what we are currently doing and so we started experimenting with systems that could do video prediction uh, we got nowhere i mean the system can sort of predict a little bit in the video mm -hmm. but the kind of representation of the world they learn from this is useless and what I, I kind of completely changed my mind about three, four years ago by realizing that the, the systems that work best to learn image representations are not generative. They're not systems where you take an image and you corrupt it and you restore it or, or, or video. They're systems that are called joint embedding. So you take a, an image and a corrupted version of it and then you train uh, encoders, neural nets to 
uh, encode the image so that you can recover the representation of the fool mm -hmm. from the representation of the corrupted. And that's not generative. You're not reconstructing pixels. And it turns out you can't reconstruct pixels in images. It's just too complicated. So you have to use those non-generative architectures. So the future of AI is non-generative. So you can see here that he's clearly stating that the future is, of course, non-generative. Now, it's pretty interesting with as to, you know, his further statement on LLMs, because in a recent interview called The Scaling Theory on the podcast, he basically said that LLMs are useless. So take a listen to this. I mean, I don't want to discredit him by stating that he said LLMs are completely useless. They're useful for, of course, text generation. But he talks about in terms of course, reaching AGI, they're not as useful as people might think. The good guess is that the, the ones that, that will be players there are the ones that can invest in research, long-term research, not just yeah. fine-tuning current systems, but like, you know, how do we change the paradigm, uh, which is basically what I personally work on. Okay, the next generation AI systems. Uh, to, uh, you know, to people like me, LLMs are, are the past. It's actually kind of boring now. Um, uh, of course, they're very useful and there is a whole industry that should be built around them. I'm not, I'm not saying uh, the opposite, but uh, but if you're interested in, in the future, um, there's kind of a lot more that, that will happen in the future and it may completely change, you know, what, what we perceive. I mean, it's entirely possible, for example, that system will become a lot smarter with a lot less data. Um, mm. You know, humans are not exposed to nearly as much text data as uh, current AI systems, yet we're still a lot smarter than those systems, right? And here is another important clip, and this is basically why he says LLM suck. Um, and hear what they're good for because I think this clip where he actually explains it and breaks it down with as to why uh, we're fooled by their fluency and they don't truly understand how the world works. I think he's stating that, you know, basically the current consensus, the current, I guess you could say, collective consciousness on how great LMs are is, I guess you could say, mistaken. You know, people are fooled by the current uh, state of things. They really are not good for anything. And so, the idea that somehow we're going to scale those up, I mean, they're very useful, but they're not good for, you know, reaching human level intelligence. So the idea we're going to scale those up and train them on even more text, which we don't have because basically they're already trained on the entirety of the public text on the internet. Um, the idea somehow we're going to scale them up and reach human intelligence is nuts. It can't possibly work. So AGI is not around the corner, if you believe in AGI. Um, and so we're easily fooled by their fluency into thinking that they are smart, but they really aren't. Um, they're useful. There's no question. We can build an entire industry around them. Okay. And more power to the people doing this. Uh, they're going to make our search engines better and everything better, you know, writing aids, everything. Um, so we're not going to get to human level intelligence by just scaling up LLMs. And the question is, what do we, what do we miss? What are we missing? Um, um, but okay, here is why perhaps we're doing all of this wrong. Why LLMs will never get to where we want. Um, so Typical LLM today is trained on 10 trillion tokens, uh, 10 to the 13th. Each token is about 0.75 word. Uh, you, can, you can sort of evaluate it this way. And each token is about two bytes. Uh, in the typical tokenization of language, you have 30,000 possible tokens, so that's two bytes, right? So do the math, that's two 10 to the 13 bytes. That's the size of the training set used to train the latest LLMs. It would take 170,000 years for any human to read through this at reading eight hours a day at 250 words per minute. Um, that's an enormous amount of information, right? Well, not really, because if you take a human child, four-year-old, a four-year-old has been awake 16,000 hours, and you try to quantify how much information has gotten to the visual cortex of that four-year-old in his or her life, uh, you got one million fiber in each optical nerve. Each optical fiber carries maybe 10 bytes per second, so that's 20 megabytes per second. Multiply by 16,000 hours, multiply by 3,600, seconds per hour, and a four-year-old child has seen 10 to the 15 bytes. That's 50 times more than the biggest LLMs in the world in four years. So what that tells you is that we're not going to reach anywhere close to human or even animal intelligence by just training from text. We've already saturated the amount of text that we can train on. You know, 10, 10 trillion token, that's basically the entire public internet. And here's where he responds to a student who essentially asks about, you know, text and basically stating that, you know, do we still want to use text? Are we going to use text at all? Uh, and this is where he kind of just explains that, you know, the VJEPA architecture is completely different because, you know, when you look at how animals learn, how peoples learn, you know, it's, it's not really based on text. Things are, I guess you could say, non-linguistic. Um, and that involves a variety of different, you know, pieces of information that you otherwise wouldn't have in text. No, it's not text. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about text, textual representation of anything. Uh, in fact, 
what I've been arguing uh, for is, is the fact that you don't want to go through text. Text is a terrible representation of knowledge. Like, I mean, the, the kind of manipulation you do in your mind when you, when you think about, like, I don't know, building a, something out of wood or something, that has nothing to do with language. Mm. It's not connected with language. Anything that any animal does has nothing to do with language, at least for most animals. So right? how do you, like, take the modality to, like, so if I'm thinking in images, how do you make a system think in images to think of the next action then if it doesn't go down to text? Well, yeah. so that's the idea of this JEPA architecture, right? Mm. You uh, train the system to produce a representation within which it can do prediction. Mm. By given an action, what's going to be the next state of the world? And that doesn't have to have any relation to text or language, right? It's just some abstract representation of the state of the world. So those were three of the most important points that he made in a talk. This is a, I think it's an hour and 10 minutes, but I only put like three minutes in because i think you know a lot of the other stuff is about like different architectures and you know just a bunch of other stuff but this is the stuff that's really important for this video because him basically saying that text is i don't say useless but you know you can't get to agi with it and you can basically see where he's stating that look like the amount of data that we think llms actually have is much less than humans are actually you know absorbing so of course i guess you know if we look at the scale in the future i mean this is why they think scale and the scaling laws are probably real with the fact that, you know, just putting more data in is going to yield bigger and bigger results. Now, um, I think this is going to be really interesting because, you know, the next level of systems, I think we're going to see if OpenAI managed to solve the data problem, if data is really the bottleneck, what they're really doing to get more out of systems and where the kind of limitations are. Now, something that was also really interesting is the fact that, you know, in this interview right here on the Lex Friedman podcast, he gives a kind of prediction date on when he thinks AGI will come. Now, everybody knows that people, most people, I would guess you would say, and I say most people, I'm talking about like people who are viewing videos like these would say that AGI is probably going to be here by 2030. Although there are some very, very, I wouldn't say conservative at all, but very some eager predictions stating that, you know, it's going to be here in seven months. It's going to be here by 2025. But I would say my prediction is still 2029. That's still mine based on some of the things that I've seen. But he says that, you know, it's going to be here in pretty much 10 years time. So this one, I wanted to include this because it's very, very fascinating with as to, you know, how he thinks about, you know, the future and of course AGI. And I mean, maybe we're just all looking in the wrong, wrong direction because there is such, I guess you could say, a love such a, so, like all the eyeballs are on OpenAI at this moment. Uh, and that's their proprietary system, you know, that they're currently using. It's not coming soon. Meaning like not this year, not the next few years, potentially yeah. f farther away. What's your basic intuition behind that? So first of all, it's not going to be an event. Right. The idea somehow, which, you know, is popularized by science fiction and Hollywood, that, you know, somehow somebody is going to discover the secret, the secret to AGI or human level AI or AMI, whatever you want to call it. And then, you know, turn on a machine and then we have AGI. That's just not going to happen. It's not going to be an event. It's going to be gradual progress. Are we going to have systems that can learn from video how the world works and learn good representations? Before we get them to the scale and performance that we observe in humans, it's going to take quite a while. It's not going to happen in one day. Um, uh, are we going to get systems that can uh, have large amount of associative memory so they can, they can remember stuff? Yeah, but same, it's not going to happen tomorrow. I mean, th there is some basic techniques that need to be developed. We have a lot of them, but like, you know, to get this to work together with a uh, full system is another story. Are we going to have systems that can reason and plan, perhaps along the lines of uh, objective-driven AI architectures that I, I described before? Yeah, but like before we get this to work, you know, properly, it's going to take a while. So, and before we get all those things to work together, and then on top of this, have systems that can learn like hierarchical planning, hierarchical representations, systems that can be configured for a lot of different situations at hands, the way the human brain can. Um, uh, you know, all of this is going to take, you know, at least a decade and probably much more because there are a lot of problems that we're not seeing right now that we have not encountered. And so we don't know if there is an easy solution within this framework. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's not just around the corner. I mean, I've, I've been hearing people for the last 12, 15 years claiming that, you know, AGI is just around the corner and being systematically wrong. And I knew they were wrong when they were saying so yeah, AGI is not around the corner. And like I said before, I think one of the most interesting things will be is, of course, 
if OpenAI, uh, you know, then their, their latest updates for GPT-5, since they're the market leader and they've had, you know, 18 months to develop a system, if it kind of, you know, leans into what Jan Lekin is saying here, because there are a lot of AI critics, including people like Gary Marcus, who have been very critical of the AI scene. Um, and there have been people like Jan Lekin that are basically saying, look, everyone's got it wrong. So I think this statement here, that's why I've included this, because, I mean, it's going to be super interesting very, very soon to see if what he is saying is true. Now, there is the super intelligence debate, and he talks about how the emergence of super intelligence is not going to be an event. And we don't have anything close to a blueprint for super intelligent systems. And then this is, you know, very interesting that he said this because, I mean, this was before, uh, you know, OpenAI's team just recently quit. So I think the fact that maybe he's onto something here because, you know, if OpenAI, you know, they kind of disbanded their super intelligence team on, you know, kind of, you know, developing it safely. Maybe he's kind of right because if, if, if OpenAI were close to super intelligence, I'm sure that they would, you know, probably be rapidly hiring for that team okay so i mean it, it's very hard to like kind of look outward you know i mean look inward from you know an outside position so i'm not going to try to speculate too much but you know this is a response also to max tegmart's tweet where he says yan my position is marked different extreme power con concentration must be avoided i completely agree super intelligence is likely to kill us all if anyone builds it before figuring out how to make it safe hence nobody should be allowed to build it before it can be safe and Basically, he's just responding to that. You know, I probably should have shown that tweet first, but he's basically saying that, like, look, it's not just one day, boom, we got super intelligence. It's going to be quite gradual. But, you know, there's a lot of disagreements with that. So, I mean, it's very hard to argue that. I mean, on one side, you have the fact that, yes, super intelligence is probably going to be gradual because things get smarter and they get smarter. And then, of course, we have the thing that, like, you know, the moment it becomes smarter than us is the moment that we die. So we're not really going to know what exactly happened. So, I mean... It's pretty, pretty crazy, okay? And this is how he describes super intelligence. He says, the design will start by having the intelligence level of a rat or a squirrel. Then we'll ramp up the intelligence progressively by simultaneously designing proper guardrails and safety mechanisms, testing it in simulated playgrounds. Then we will design it in such a way that its only purpose will be to fulfill goals specified by humans. I call this objective driven AI and it will be a diligent problem solving server for us. And Max seems to believe in the unrealistic sci-fi trope of a suddenly appearing super intelligent and super powerful system that also wants to take over. Um, and he says that fi that flies over in the fact of uh, how we know everything works. Now, there were a lot of disagreements with this, but in this one right here, he actually talks about how even with this development that they're trying to do, there's also, I guess you could say, a problem because, uh, you know, there's there's a hardware issue that, you know, we need to solve first. I mean, certainly scale is necessary, but not sufficient. Absolutely. So we certainly need computation. I mean, we're still far in terms of compute power uh, from, you know, what we would need to match the compute power of the human brain. Um, you know, this may occur in the next couple of decades, but, um, but we're still some ways away. And certainly in terms of power efficiency, we're really far. Um, so there's a lot of progress to make in, uh, in, in, in hardware. And, you know, right now, a lot of the progress is, is, is not, I mean, there's a bit coming from silicon technology, but a lot of it coming from architectural innovation and quite a bit coming from, uh, uh, like more efficient ways of, you know, implementing the architectures that have become popular, basically combination of transformers and convnets, right? <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, you know, there's st still some ways to go until, uh, we're gonna saturate. We're gonna have to come up with like new, new principles, new fabrication technology, new uh, basic components. Um, perhaps you know, based on sort of different principles than those classical digital CMOS. Interesting. So you think in order to build AMI, I mean, we need, we potentially might need some hardware innovation too. Well, if you want to make it um, ubiquitous, yeah, certainly. Because we're going to have to reduce the, you know, compute the power consumption. A GPU today, right, is half a kilowatt to a kilowatt. Mm -hmm. Human brain is about 25 watts. Uh, and the GPU is way below the power of human brain. You need, you know, something like 100,000 or a million to match it. So, uh, so you know, we are off by a huge factor here. So I know... Uh you know, he spoke about how the energy problem is a real thing because the human brain is remarkably efficient. But there are other things that people are working on that are, I guess you could say, advances in chips that 
really, really do make the difference. Now, essentially what I'm going to show you in this small talk right here is a discussion on photonic chips. And this is basically, you know, it's basically stating that supercomputing is no longer a niche field thanks to LLM. So basically, of course, now that LLMs are here, people are, you know, desperately trying to find a way to scale these systems. And it's pretty hard to do when you have uh, very, very inefficient computers compared to the human brain. So uh, photonic chips use light instead of electrical signals to perform computations, offering another pathway to energy efficient computing. And this is based on their energy efficiency because they have light speed processing and light can travel, you know, a lot faster with less resistance than electrical signals, leading to faster and more efficient data processing and optical signals actually generate less heat compared to electrical signals, which can actually reduce cooling requirements and overall energy consumption. And then, of course, you've got photonic chips that actually can handle higher bandwidths, making them ideal for data intensive tasks. And they have parallelism, which means that they can also process multiple signals simultaneously, similar to neuromorphic chips, enhancing their efficiency. So some companies are actually trying to work on this. And basically with these LLMs or whatever kind of system you're really working on, uh, I think, well, some people think that this actually might be the next breakthrough. And what's crazy as well is that I do believe that Sam Altman slash OpenAI may have actually invested in some of these companies. So take a look at this. I wasn't sure whether or not I wanted to include this in the video because it might not be relevant to AGI. But I do think that, you know, when we look back on the kind of breakthroughs that do get us there, faster chips is something that just does make sense. OK, uh, and it's pretty crazy at, you know, what's going on here for performance out of computer chips. Uh, Jensen had GTC announcement yesterday, I believe, where he showed a chip that was twice as big for twice the performance. And that's sort of what we're doing in terms of scaling today. So the core technology that's driven, you know, Moore's law and Denard's scaling that made computers faster and cheaper and has democratized, you know, computing for the world and made this AGI hunt that we're on possible is coming to an end. So at Light Matter, what we're doing is we're looking at how do you continue scaling? And everything we do is centered around light. We're using light to move the data between the chips allow you to scale it to be much bigger so that you can get to, you know, 100,000 nodes, a million nodes and beyond. Try to figure out what's required to get to AGI, what's required to get to these next gen models. So this is kind of what a present day supercomputer looks like. Uh, you'll have racks of networking gear and you'll have racks of computing gear. And there are, you know, a lot of interconnections when you're inside one of the computing racks. But then you kind of get a spaghetti, you know, a few links over to the networking racks and this very weak sort of interconnectivity in these clusters. And what that means is that when you map a computation like an AI training workload onto these supercomputers, you're basically having to slice and dice it so that big pieces of it fit in the tightly interconnected clusters. You're having a really hard time scaling, getting a really good unit performance scaling as you get to you know, 50,000 GPUs running a workload. So I would basically tell you that 1,000 GPUs is not just 1,000 GPUs. It really depends how you wire these together. And that wiring is where a significant amount of the value is. This is present day data centers. What if we deleted all the networking racks? What if we deleted all of these? And what if we scaled the compute to be 100 times larger? And what if instead of the spaghetti, we have linking everything together. What if we had an all to all interconnect? What if we deleted all of the networking equipment in the data center? This is the future that we're building at Light Matter. So this is literally the future of where you can see that data centers are going to change. And that's why I say companies like Light Matter with their, you know, photonic chips are really innovative and they're really important to like what we're going to be looking at. So that's why I wanted to include this because, you know, uh, as we talk about the energy efficiency, it's something that people kind of don't really talk about. But, you know, when you're training these models that are like a hundred billion dollars, you know, supercomputers and stuff like that, like it's just so un unefficient like when you actually think about it but you know eventually we will get there but it's it's of course you know as Jan Lecan just pointed out it's an important point that you know most people don't really remember we're looking at how you get these ai supercomputers to get to the next model it's going to be super expensive and it's going to require fundamentally new technologies and this is the core technology this is called passage and this is how all gpus and switches are going to be built um, we work with companies like AMD, Intel, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, places like this, and we put their chips on top of our optical interconnect 
substrate. It's the foundation for how AI computing will make progress. It will reduce, in, it'll reduce the energy consumption of these clusters dramatically, and it will enable scaling to a million nodes and beyond. Um, this is how you get to wafer scale, the biggest chips in the world, and this is how you get to AGI. And a very recent, recent thing here was what he was stating about LLMs. And he basically said that, like, look, don't work on LLMs if you're getting into AI research and development right now, because LLMs have, I wouldn't say hit their plateau, but I guess LLMs are just the backbone of these AI systems that we're currently integrating with our technologies. But the next stage, I'm guessing what he's basically saying here is that the next stage that's going to lead us into, I guess you could say a kind of different era where we're actually do we are actually truly having you know human level intelligence i think he's basically saying that look this is what i'm working on and this is what you should be working on too my picture of the progress of ai let's, let's think of this as some sort of highway on, on the path towards reproducing perhaps human level intelligence or beyond and on that path you know that ai has followed for the last 60 or 70 years it's been a, bu a bunch of branches so which gave rise to classical computer science, so which gave rise to pattern recognition, computer vision, you know, other things, speech recognition, etc. And all of those things had practical importance at one point in the past, but were not on the main road to uh, you know, ultimate intelligence, if you will. I view LLM as another one of those off-ramps. It's very useful. Um, it's a whole industry building itself around it, which is awesome. Uh, we're working on it at, at Meta, obviously, but for people like me who are interested in what's the next exit on the highway, uh, or perhaps not even the next exit, like how do I make progress on this highway, it's an off mm. So I tell uh, PhD students, young students who are interested in AI research for the next generation AI systems, I tell them, do not work on LLM. There's no point working on LLM. This is in the hands of product divisions in large companies, there's nothing you can bring to that table. You should work on the next generation AI system that uh, lifts the limitation of LLMs, which you know, all of us uh, have some idea of there. So it's going to be interesting, okay? It's going to be very, very interesting because Sam Altman predicts that, you know, five years give or take maybe slightly longer, which kind of actually lines up with his prediction. Uh, and, you know, Elon Musk stated that AGI is going to be here in 2025. And, you know, uh, Ray Kurzweil stated that it's going to be here at 2030 slash 2029. So, I mean, in on a spectrum, things are just different, you know, things are really just different. But I think overall, stating that there's no such thing as AGI, stating that, you know, I guess you could say this is not the architecture that we need. And the architecture that we do truly need is, of course, VJEPA. I mean, it's a bold statement, but he does truly, truly have some claims. Now, I think this is the, 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 the point where things are going to change is either... The GPT-5 level systems and what OpenAI has been working on, we're truly going to see uh, what limitations have been overcome. Or maybe he makes a breakthrough and his entire team that are working on this kind of show us that, look, we were right all along. And this is uh, truly where things are going to be. So the next couple of years, I genuinely think are going to be so interesting because we truly are going to understand where certain things are and where things uh, are going to be.